Guided selling from Ring DNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts are hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let Ring DNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. And I think that quantity metric is what most sales leaders are measuring. Hey, Mark, how many calls did you make today? How many new prospects did you talk to today? How many opportunities did you move? Not, hey, Mark, tell me the best conversation you had today. You know, like, what was the best conversation you had today and how did that go? Let's run through that. It's a different mindset. And the problem is that that's a longer conversation for the sales manager, right? So if I say, Mark, how many calls did you make today? How many you know, conversations did you I had 15. Good stuff, mate. Well done. That's it. That you know, mini coaching session <laughs> is over, right? If I say, hey, Mark, what was your best conversation today and how did that go? I've got to stick around. Hi, friends. Welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. Now, that was Mark McInnes, and Mark's the author of a book titled Tactical Pipeline Growth, Winning the Outbound Battle for New Business. I enjoyed Mark's book and this conversation with him because he's a bit of a contrarian in some of his takes on the myths and bad practices that have built up around prospecting. For openers, we talk about why Mark believes that it's better to have too few prospects in your pipeline than a few too many. And we dive into his observation that most struggling reps really do have too many prospects in their pipeline. You know, I happen to agree with this because you know, I think this low levels of quota attainment and the really low win rates that we're seeing across many industries are not a function of not having leads. It's all about how ineffective sellers are once they have leads, in which case more leads won't solve the problem. So we'll also dig into how to help sellers become more consistently effective. And that's a big goal of mine. I mean, isn't anyone else tired about hearing about the mythical top performers? If you want to be at the top of the list, you have to follow, I think, Mark's advice, which I think was a great bit of wisdom. He said that consistently good always beats occasionally great. So we're going to get into this and much, much more. But before we get to Mark, I want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. And if you subscribe, we'd certainly appreciate it. If you could also give us your feedback about how we're doing in the form of a review. So thank you. All right, let's jump into it with Mark. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, Andy. Thanks for uh, having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. So uh, people probably recognize your accent. You're joining us from Australia. Where in Australia are you? Uh, right in downtown Sydney. So I'm lucky enough to live um, one mile from the local from the post office of Sydney. So I'm right in the heart of Sydney. It's a great spot. Right in the heart. So... Where are you compared to like the Opera House? Uh, probably one and a half miles. So back from the harbour. If you've been to Sydney, mm -hmm. you'll notice that it's there's a bit of a hill, and mm -hmm. I'm on top of the top of the hill, um, just overlooking the city. So excellent. Uh, yeah, so a suburb called Surrey Hills, close to King's Cross. Close uh, to King's Cross. Point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Famous spot for nightlife and so on well not anymore it's been uh, turned oh, into really? a residential area yeah 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 so <laughs> it's been a while well, I, used to, I used to i went to australia a lot in the 80s and 90s uh maybe a dozen times overall and um yeah i think i ventured out there once but i mostly stayed i don't know if it still is an intercontinental that was right across from the royal botanical gardens yep great and, spot yeah and great for running i used to swim in the Andy Boy Charlton pool there in the Royal Botanical Garden as well. Brought my goggles, so I'd go for a run, bring my swim swimsuit under my running shorts and goggles, and then go hop in the pool. Okay, yep, great. That's it. look when you when you're in Sydney and you're staying in those hotels in those locations, you really get the best piece of, of Sydney. Of course, most people live you know twenty kilometers out of town, <laughs> and you know what you see on the postage stamp is not what most people uh, get to experience of, of Sydney. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know it was, it was gorgeous down there. And then, yeah, my running route always entailed running through the Batar Park all the way down around the Opera House and back up and 
yeah, it was, and usually the weather was gorgeous. Um, hmm. So, Not yeah, it's raining. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had a couple massive thunderstorms when I was there on a couple of occasions that were during your summer, which were fantastic, but um, it generally lucked out. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, there we go. Yeah, so you've been in Sydney and managed to avoid COVID-19 and all those things. So far, um, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty lucky. We have very low um, transmission rates here in New South Wales in our state. Um, Australia, so Victoria at the moment has got a bit of what they're calling a second wave, but, but yeah. it's really just hundreds of cases a day. It's, it's certainly not as bad as it, it could be. And, and in New South Wales, we, you know, it's a dozen cases a day. So, oh, nice. Um, okay. They're mostly working from home and just being well behaved. <laughs> wearing, wearing your mask when you go outside. Correct. Yeah, that's yes. exactly right. Such an easy thing to do, wear a mask. Yeah, that, that defeats many people here. So, um, all right, we're going to talk about your new book you've got out called Tactical uh, Pipeline Growth. Correct. Winning, winning the outbound battle for new business. So, I mean, first question, there's a bazillion books on prospecting. They've been written. So what was the impetus to write yet another book about prospecting? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, well, I just wanted to give something to the sellers. So there's a lot of really great books, really good books, um, but they seem to be aimed predominantly at um, sales managers, sales leaders, you know, for that transformational piece. And it talks, they typically talk a lot about strategy. And I wanted to write something that was a manual that people could take into their businesses and, and apply, you know, so basically follow the step-by-step -step process to start being more effective in their prospecting. What I see is a lot of people tell me they just, they're not sure where to start. They don't know what they should be doing. Um, so this was designed at that sort of BDM, AE type level. Um, here mm -hmm. in Australia, it's, it's very typical for salespeople to, to manage existing business and then have to build new business as well. You know, we, we, we don't have a lot of organizations that have that SDR function, you know, that are just appointment setters. There are right. those. But, but typically, most salespeople have got to manage existing business and grow new business as well. So, so full cycle sellers. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, and that's typical of a lot of my clients. So, it was just a way of, uh, you know, filling that gap. So, you know, what are salespeople need to go and read that they can go and execute on? So, so that was what well, I thought there was a hole in the market, or at least that was what people were telling me. Um, and, and I also think that there's a lot of really good content out there that doesn't quite hit the mark in relation to um, actionable skills for salespeople on the front line. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there's there's a small amount of good content on a lot of bad content. But um, you wrote something that, that was sort of interesting. At the, I can't remember if this was in the book or – because I had it in my notes before I read the book – um, that you believe that sellers in general have too many prospects in their pipeline. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and so I know that's counterintuitive. So you, most people will say that, you know, salespeople aren't doing enough outbound activity. They're not starting enough conversations. And I agree with that. But I think one of the biggest problems is that sales leaders m manage their sales teams off the weight of their pipeline. So, you know, Andy, let's say I'm a sales leader and I come to you and say, look, we need to have three times your – um, revenue and you, or, or, or whatever. <laughs> it, 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 in the SaaS um, business, it's five. It's like table stakes for most of those companies. Okay, great. Let's go with that. Five times, you know, pipeline. Um, and what that means is that salespeople put deals into the front, front of their pipeline that have actually got very low chances of, of closing and they mm -hmm. conduct random acts of prospecting. So let's say you're my perfect client. Um, you know, I put you into my pipeline as a lead. You know, I send you an email. Um, most businesses, most salespeople don't have any rhythm around that outreach. So, you know, then something will pop up and I'll think, oh, I should send Andy uh, another message. So if I'm feeling brave, I might call you up and, and leave a voicemail. Then, you know, uh, I'll look through my pipeline in a month's time and go, oh, Andy, that's right. I need to let's um, find something on LinkedIn. I'll send him a, a, an article. You know, so these end up being random acts of social. And, and so when I'm questioned by my sales manager about how deliberately I'm prospecting to talk to Andy, I'll say, oh, yeah, I've reached out, you know, seven, eight, ten times over the last six months. The reality is when you look through those those activities in your CRM, it's probably really only reached out three or four times over six months. And and that rhythm, that activity 
is, is not sufficient to get your interest or a prospect's interest. So why I say they've got too many people in their pipeline is because they're trying to keep this you know, five times coverage um, of, of leads in their pipeline, and that means that they don't have they don't deliberately try and pursue a conversation with Andy <laughs> um, mm-hmm. in, in a way that's actually going to create enough prospecting pressure, and I mean that in a good way, right. for Andy to go, hang on a second, okay, Mark's trying to reach out to me. He's reached out to me, you know, two or three times across different platforms in a, in a relatively short period of time. I'm now making like I can, you know, he has my interest. I'm in a position now where I need to either engage or, or maybe say, hey, Mark, this is not this is not for me. And that gives the rep the freedom to be able to take you out of the pipeline or, better still, have a conversation. And, and that's why I think people have got too many deals in their pipeline because they're not actually pursuing them. They think they're pursuing them, but they're not. Yeah, now, see, I would argue that those deals, prior to having a substantive conversation, aren't really in the pipeline. Right. This, so as I was reading the book, I sort of think, okay, well, I've got a different frame of reference here because, because um, you know, you talk about random acts of prospecting. You know, I think the problem is in general, and I believe that uh, certainly in large swath of like SaaS businesses, they have too many prospects in their pipeline because for most of them, they just engage in random acts of selling, <laughs> and and the consequences. A lot of prospects, low win rate, very low win rate. And I'm just churning through you know, all these potential opportunities even, even though, to your point, precisely, as a lot of them may be crap, but I don't even have the time to, to really service those that I've, are in there. So yeah. that's why I think I agree with you is that there's, maybe for different reasons, but there's, in general, a lot of sellers have too many prospects in their pipeline and and some of the reasons are not just because they aren't sufficiently you know further along in the, the initial engagement, but also just because once we've had that initial conversation, we just do a really bad job of discovery and qualification, and they really don't belong there. Right. Yep. Absolutely. So, I, I, so it sounds like we we're in agreement that you know that there's if you focus on too many people, you're going to be bad at at, at, at servicing those clients' needs or those prospects' needs. Well, and you address this in the book is is um, we're going to get to this a little bit later. But I mean, it's for many companies they're basically just playing the odds, right? If I put yeah. enough stuff into the top of my pipeline, top of the funnel, and I know through my process I can close a you know relatively predictable percentage of those, even though it's a low percentage, the way I increase my sales is putting more stuff into the top of the funnel. Yeah, and and, and I'm. Really interested in in automation um, from a professional standpoint. Like I mean, but you see this a lot happening on things like LinkedIn, where people just they talk about being focused on quality. On on you'll see this everywhere. Mm-hmm. Everyone everyone mm-hmm. says you know we should be engaging at a high level. We should be talking like a peer when we have a conversation with our prospects. We should be leading with value, bring insights, you know. And then the same people or the or you know in the, in the same LinkedIn feed. You know, there's all this information about MarTech, sale, you know, sales technology, how you can automate your outreach. You know, so that, that's just another version well, of quality, my favorite, right? My favorite, my favorite <laughs> saying, when I, I wrote a post about this on LinkedIn a few weeks ago, is I called this, you know, of setting a record because there were multiple oxymorons in one statement. Is talking about automated personalized outreach at scale. And it's yeah. like, okay, <laughs> there's at least two, maybe three oxymorons in that statement right there. Yeah, exactly. But you know, if if you run a and I've done this, if you run a webinar called you know personalization at scale, you will get lots of people attending. <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> yes, you will. But, but because everyone's looking for the, for the silver bullet. But if you sit down and say to somebody, you know, there's no silver bullet in sales, right? They'll say, yeah, absolutely. Like you know, it's all about quality. And then they go straight away to oh look there's a now there's a webinar on how to <laughs> how to scale my authenticity. Yeah, like, it, it, I'm sorry, I've heard that one. That's a good one. But that's but that's exactly right though. Is, is so how do we sort of how do we break that sort of cycle of people sort of wanting the silver bullet, the recipe laid out step by step? Because well. Let me ask that question first, and we'll come back. What do you think? How do you, how do you break that cycle of people wanting the recipe? 
Well, I think, you know, well, first of all, we need to acknowledge that what we're doing a lot of the time now isn't really working. Okay, so, so, and we're not doing anybody any favors. We've got sales leaders that are stressed out because they can't see enough, there's not enough transparency in what their sales reps are doing. And I use the term reps as in a represent, you know, someone yeah. that represents yeah. your organization, right? So, right. so, so that's a BDE, a, C, a selling CEO, and, a, a, you know, and um, an account executive or whoever. Um, so, the sales leaders don't have enough transparency to see what their sales teams are doing, or they don't think that there's enough outbound activity going on. So they're leveraging the, you know, do more activity front. On the on the sales reps um, front, they know that they want to be seen as authentic. They know that they want to be seen as a valuable tool as part of the sales process. So they don't want to be, you know, sending out spammy messages or or being inauthentic. They want to be authentic. So we've got this mism- mismatch happening. Um, and so the first place to start is to get both of those two stakeholders, the sales reps and the sales leaders, aligned in their mindset, and, and that is to understand that quality will equal the results um, as long as you give the sales reps the space and if the sales and give the sales reps the right mindset to to go and start those conversations. And I guess Andy, I ask you, you're, you're a very experienced individual. Um, you know, what's the number one driver of, of success for the individuals that you've seen that have been very, very successful in sales? I be, well, it's it's mindset to some degree. Yeah. And I, and I, but I, I think that in general, salespeople, once they've been trained, pretty similarly skilled. I, I, see, I don't mm. think it's sales skills that make a huge difference. I think it's perspective. And I think yeah. this is this is the thing that that is missing is is and it's multiple perspectives. One of them is what is my job in sales? Let's just start there. And you you touch on it uh, through the book is yeah I believe that my job as a seller and for every seller is not to sell your product. That's not your job. That's an outcome of what you do. But your job is to help your buyers make a purchase decision. Correct. But so few sellers are armed with that perspective. And you can think about, okay, if I wake up in the morning and I'm thinking about what my job is today, you know, I've encountered very few that really understand and have internalized this idea is that my job is to help my buyers make a purchase decision. Yes, and it seems to move quickly into a, a situation of manipulation. Right? So how can I manipulate a person who's at yes. stage, stage two of my pipeline to move to stage four of my pipeline? How can I manipulate Mark to go from showing some interest to saying, please send me a, a quote or a proposal because that's the next step in my pipeline and then I'll be able to show that I've moved this opportunity from yes. stage, two, stage two to stage four and that'll get my boss off, off my back. Yeah, well, I think, I think that, that with that is, uh, again, this is another part of the mindset, is, is we train sellers to think that their job is to persuade a buyer to agree to purchase their product. Now, there's research been done by you know, psychologists and researchers and so on that have documented this very real thing that exists called persuasion resistance. So people have a natural resistance, so we call it a cognitive bias, whatever we want, to being persuaded. Yep. And so it's sort of ironic that so much of our training of our sellers is oriented to adopt the one behavior that everybody in the world hates. <laughs> it's like, well, what's wrong with that picture? Yeah. And so, so I think the perspective, another perspective, is, is that your job is to influence an outcome. And the difference is, you know, if you have a what I call persuasion mindset, your perspective is, I know what's right for the customer, and therefore I'm going to persuade them to buy that, as opposed to my job is to help the customer understand what's best for them. And in, in helping that customer understand what's best for them, maybe my language needs to be more persuasive, and, I'm, and I mean that is in the, the theory of influence, as opposed to manipulation. Yeah, so, I mean, right, and you talk about that, but I think that that – yeah, I, I look at influence slightly different than like Cialdini has in his book, um, because I think I think persuasion and influence are 
two fundamentally different behaviors and are received differently. So I, I, I try to separate them, even though he, he uses both in the title of his book. Um, but I mean, that's a, a longer conversation for another day. But it's, it's you know, you have opportunities to use your curiosity to, to not just educate yourself, but really to educate the buyer, right? I mean, it's the questions you ask that help the buyer begin to develop a further understanding of what is the problem they're trying to solve and what are the available options in order to solve it. Yeah, and, and we've all had those experiences in life where we've gone to buy something and we thought we were going to buy, you know, uh, you know, like I do a bit of a bit of bike riding, for example. Oh, and, and, and you think, you know, so you go to your bike shop, right, and you think, okay, I need to buy some new um, aero handlebars because that's going to make me go faster. And you go in there with, <laughs> and, 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 you know, or, or a new bike. I was going to say, you're, you're going for the handlebars, you walk out with the bike. <laughs> well, you know, and, 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 but, but if you've got a good store, right, you know, he might say, you actually don't need a new bike, you actually need a set of aero wheels because I know that you're riding around Sydney and it's, you know, it's predominantly flat, blah, 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 blah. You know, so the aero wheels, you're not going to cost you $3,000, not going to cost you $10,000 for the bike, but you're probably going to get the same gains, you know. And so do you feel persuaded or do you feel educated? You, you, you leave there going, oh, you know, I wasn't thinking about wheels, but now I am. Uh, and the, tr- the trust that you feel educated. And what's the what's happened to the the bike shop owner? Is the trust gone up or down? Up, ah. right? So I call you know that what? influence, not persuasion. So they were able to have an impact on your behavior and your thought process, and you know, not by force of argument, by asking you questions, by demonstrating experience. So Cialdini yeah. would say. When the bike shop owner says, Mark, having sold lots of bikes to people just like you. Social proof, I understand. But yeah, yeah. so that's, that's, that's it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, I've, he's been on the show. We've talked about that. But I, but I think that, that I think these, these um, some people might call them narrow slicing of perspective, but I think they're hugely important. And, and, yeah, you know, for me is like when I look at you know thought leadership and sales and so on is is what frustrates me is that so much of it just seems to be sort of the same, and it's not that there's an absence of value in some of that rehashing, but what we really need, and you and I were talking about before we started recording, is is we really need some serious transformation in the B two B sales space, and not you know the sort of fake tech driven revolution that everybody thinks was so revolutionary. And perspective is really how we're going to get there. Okay. What do you mean? What do you mean by perspective? Well, like I said, is what's your job? Right. Okay. We have to people change people's. We talk about being buyer centric, but no one hardly ever does it. Right. It works until you get in front of the customer, and then they go to the you know persuasion toolbox. But it's like, right. yeah. What, what's my job? My job is to help the buyer make a purchase decision. Full stop. But what's that mean for every step that we take? in our sales interactions. It may or may not align. In fact, I'd say oftentimes doesn't align with off the sales processes that, that you know, companies put together, which are all bent on how do I get an order? Well, you're going to get an order you know, if you execute from your perspective, so, your process. But go ahead. Yeah, it's pretty hard to um, manipulate people in a B2B space to buy something that they don't need, I would, I would think, these days. I mean, Sort of, would, would you agree with that, or do you think that there are people out there buying products that, that they don't need and don't want based on the, mani- <laughs> the, the manipulation skills of, of salespeople? Because I actually I don't see that, and maybe that's just maybe that's yeah, just yeah. I don't I don't see it. I think the difference is is again a slightly maybe a, a fine difference is that I wouldn't call it manipulation. It's just that hey, this is I've got this one thing to sell. And this is what I'm going to sell. And I will use whatever I can within you know, ethical means. I'm saying this hypothetically, what people say, to sell this to you. And yeah, it may not be the best fit. And that's, you know, you could say, okay, someone's just doing their job. So I think there's, there's some degree of that happens, but it's not. Yeah, I don't think it's, it doesn't warrant the stereotype that sellers have that all they're trying to do is sell you something regardless of what you need. And that's what you mean by and that's what you mean by perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I and part of that's just re 
starting at the beginning is, you know, it's, it's such a culture change up and down organizations, up and down our profession. And uh, yeah, that to me becomes the true revolution. You know, it's not driven by the technology we use. It's driven by the mindset that people have about what they're trying to do. Yeah. And, and, and who they're trying to, to help, I think. Well, true, who they're trying to help. But I mean, you have to look at it from the buyer's perspective as, as, you know, as well as, is, you know, what's the buyer trying to accomplish? You know, when they get into a, a, a uh, you know, buying journey, what are they, what are they trying to accomplish in the context of that journey? Setting aside, excuse me, they're trying to make a, you know, achieve a certain outcome with the result of their investment. But in that process, what are they trying to achieve? Yeah. And, and well, I mean, that, that was, you know, the question is, for me, the answer to the question is, well, what buyers are trying to do is buyers are trying to quickly gather information to make a good decision with the least possible investment of time, money, and resources. That makes perfect and, sense. And yet, you'd ask most sellers, and they'd say, well, they're trying to make the best decision. I'm, my process is geared to help this customer make the best possible decision. And yet, science is pretty clear. We talked about the whole theory of you know, bounded, bounded rationality and, and satisficing decisions is that, yeah, most people just want to make the good enough decision. Because they don't have an unlimited amount of time to invest in making any one purchase decision. Uh, and also, yeah. they operate with certain constraints. You know, information's imperfect. Uh, you know, their ability to understand the problem, blah, blah, blah. So, but the point being is, is that's another you know, mindset difference that I think impairs the ability of sellers to succeed. So, m- moving to a focus on quality rather than quantity is not doing that in- entire piece justice. But that's 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 the overarching mindset yeah. behind the book. Yeah, it's it's to yeah. move move to. So that's a shortcut to your very excellent explanation. <laughs> <laughs> now, maybe it was, but I, I don't know how quality it was. But 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 I think this is this is yeah, this has become you know passion thing for me as I get older and more experience and so on. It's just like true true change has to be driven by yeah by quality. And and to your point, you, know, you talked about you know you have too many prospects in your pipeline, and we've got these pipeline coverage ratios. Is and I know your book is more concerned on sort of you know, top of the funnel type activities, but but I think it applies throughout. It's like okay, if 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 you're C, if you're a CRO or you're a sales leader of some sort, and you've got your team marching along at a five x pipeline coverage ratio, which is not unusual at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, I. Came across the company at the start of this year that was talking about seven and nine X pipeline coverage ratio, which horrified me. Is and they weren't that transactional of a business either. Is um, you know what if what if your CEO came to you and said, "Look, you got to make your number this year, but your pipeline coverage ratio can't exceed two point five X." What would you do differently to hit your number? Well, wouldn't you get rid of all of the the the, the bottom forty percent of deals straight away? Well, potentially, right? But I mean, this would strike fear into the heart of, of most sales managers and sellers these days. But it starts speaking to what you talk about in your book is is you know the the quality of outreach and the cadence as you focus on, which is you know great practical guide in the last third of the book about putting together your cadence starts making a difference, right? In terms of being more targeted and who you're bringing into the funnel. And again, it's it's. You're talking about a full cycle rep, but yeah, I think we're you know there are indications that a lot of companies, some number of companies, I'll qualify that, that went down the SDR path are now starting to say, well, maybe we need to do at least some portion of our business with full cycle reps again. Yeah. So I personally think it's very difficult for SDRs to have good quality conversations unless it is a transactional type of. Well, they're not um, trained. So- we're well, asking too much of them, I think, is, is part of the problem is, you know, we take our, our entry-level people and expect them to have conversations that require some level of business acumen that they just don't have the experience. So, if we think about that bike shop example that I used, so if I, I go to the, to the bike shop and Jeremy, who's my bike shop owner, you know, he's uh-huh. got four, four or five people on the floor and, and they are accomplished riders and people that I know and like. 
But what do you think I do when I go to the shop? I hang around until Jeremy's free. <laughs> well, that's funny you do that. I'm laughing because, yeah, I sort of do the same thing at the bike shop I go to. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it could be just him saying, well, you know, th- this, this light's going to be better for you. You know, it could be something fairly transactional that one of the, the other guys or girls could have helped me out with. But, you know, I want to get advice from somebody who I know, like, and trust, but also is somebody that I consider to be an expert. So if you take that to a B2B space, you know, if you've got an SDR that's, that's setting someone up, and, and I, I, I really struggle with the whole idea of, hey, Andy, you know, let's take a meeting and let me hand you over to Mark. Right. I, I just, you know, I just, well, hang on a second, I was just getting to, getting to know you. Now, if it's super transactional, I'm buying a telephone plan or, or something like that, I get it, right, because there's no relationship there at all. So I just want to put that out there. But, but a lot of my clients aren't, you know, if they're full circle reps, you know, then they're holding mm-hmm. their hand to those clients all the way through. You know, you, you, you want to engage with the person who's going to help you and, and you need to set that, that bit of trust up front, you know, or prove your expertise so that you, f- you feel safe handing over information. Because as a salesperson, unless you get enough information, you can't prescribe something that's going to be a good fit. So if I'm nervous about sharing information with you about how much money I've got to spend, what my goals are that I'm trying to achieve, uh, any of those sorts of things, then it's going to be really hard to provide next steps that are going to be valuable. Would you, does that make yeah, sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think I, This is, I think, one of the underestimated uh, aspects of sales that that people don't put their minds around is that you, sellers tend to think that, well, if I ask a, a buyer a question, they're going to answer it. You know, if it's not, you know, a personal question or something like that, but it's, but trust has to exist to some degree to start answering levels uh, or questions of, um, you know, deeper complexity or more proprietary nature or whatever, right? Is is you have to earn the right to ask those questions. And yeah, I agree with you. I think that I, I agree with you that that we put SDRs in the position of asking questions that, in some cases, yeah, you know, the trust hasn't been earned to get an answer. Yep. Or, or in, in air, air quotes, you know, they're not, not qualified to ask or not qualified to answer. So if you, if you were to give the answer, does the SDR, is the SDR the right person to be able to give you qualified information? Or do they just write it down in the CRM and pass it off to the AE? Well, they're, they're, they're being trained to qualify someone to take a demo or to take a meeting. Yeah. And, and the problem, I think, in some companies exists is that then the AEs are taking that as saying, Oh, well, they thus are qualified as an opportunity because they took this meeting with me. And and the logic <laughs> the logic doesn't flow, right? Because that wasn't a detailed qualification. And I think that that what we find is that the level of qualification is and discovery is too thin. Yeah. And to your point, I think you're making earlier is is that there's a fear to sort of go deeper because then you have to disqualify them. So we, we're this, back to you're better off with less people in your pipeline or the front of your front of your pipe. I agree. I mean, that's that's the way <laughs> I operated for for years. Is I I wanted myself and my sellers to have just enough prospects. So, yeah. So, so it takes a long time to, to get to this point. Like I'm, you know, 52 this year. I'm pretty sure I'm 52 this year. No, 52. Uh, <laughs> but it, not takes, it must be all that bike riding. <laughs> thank you. Um, so it's the – but it took me a long time to get to the point where, you know, you realize that you're better off having higher quality conversations and less of them than, than just trying to have as many conversations as, as, as possible. And, and but that goes know, against it's, the grain. That goes against the grains. I mean, you wrote in the book, you said, you know, that not too long ago, the going wisdom was that sales is just a numbers game, but um, it still is for most. And I, I don't think that works any longer. And you say it doesn't work. And it's, it's to me, that's something that just fundamentally needs to change is that instead of just playing the conversion game is let's, let's play the sales game. Let's start selling again. Yeah. Well, it's, well, it's a numbers game if, you've, if your number is zero. <laughs> right. So, so if you had, if you if you're doing zero meetings today, if you're taking making zero calls, okay, then it's a numbers game because you've got to improve those numbers. 
Yeah. Right? But, but I'd be saying let's try, let's try and have one or two conversations with somebody who you know is your perfect client and you can actually bring some real value to the conversation, not have five random conversations and hope that one of them is going to stick. And, and I think that that quality, that quantity metric is, is what most sales leaders are measuring. Hey, Mark, how many calls did you make today? How many new prospects did you talk to today? How many, how many opportunities did you move? Yeah. yeah. How many conversations did you have? Yeah. Yeah. Not, hey, Mark, tell me the best conversation you had today. You know, like what was the best conversation you had today and how did that go? Let's run through that. So it's a, it's a, diff, a different mindset. And, and the problem is, well, I, I, I believe the problem is that that's a longer conversation for the sales manager, right? So if I say, Mark, how many sales, how many calls did you make today? How many, you know, conversations did you have? I had 15. Good stuff, mate. Well done. That's it. That, that you know, mini coaching session. <laughs> and I'm laughing because it's air quotes. Not, air quotes, yeah. <laughs> is over, right? If I say, hey, Mark, what was your best conversation today and how did that go? I've got to stick around. And I've got to show my expertise as a sales leader and I've got to be engaged. Because then Mark's going to go, well, the best conversation I had today was with Mary. And it went like this. But you know what, boss? I, when we got to the comp piece about, you know, this, I didn't know what to say. What, what should have I done next? Well, you know? but they, <laughs> you know, those, that sales team is using let's say ring DNA and the conversational AI, I have to give a plug here for the, the home team. That's okay. Go for is it. is the seller say, well let's, you know, can you listen to this call? And let's listen to this call. And can you, you know, here at the you know four minutes and 20 second mark, I had this issue. How could you help me with that? Yep. And yeah, that takes a commitment on the part of managers is I am going to have a schedule to be listening to the calls of my seller so I can provide that type of coaching. Yeah. And I, I mean, I love the solution. How many people that you talk to or that your team talks to are actually recording calls and, and, and checking them? I, I would imagine. Oh, the users are for sure. The people that are in buying your service are, but yeah, you know, yeah, what's yeah. that as, as a, as a proportion of the sales, bigger sales. Um, that's, that's why we exist to, <laughs> make the world safe for that yes yeah but i mean that's yeah. that is you know a technology that this is a case of actually a technology that really helps sellers right as opposed to you know just being a <laughs> automated outreach at scale right it's it's uh yeah this is something that really improves the effectiveness of what you what you do both the coaching and you know the subsequent production of the the seller yeah. So, so, so one of the things that I see a lot on the technology space, and, and I'm a big fan of sales enablement tools, mm -hmm. sales engagement tools, but, but you know, what the sales cadences that we see that come from some of those big suppliers, predominantly based out of the US, come to Australia, you know, the cadence that comes to us is typically, you know, call in the morning and email in the afternoon, you know, call again on day three in the morning, mm. call in the afternoon. Now, that just doesn't work here. Which is great for me because my cadence program is different, and those people in, you know buy those enablement programs, those engagement programs, and then they ask me to come and build out cadences uh, that have a, a broader touch, you know, and a, and a and a more specific touch for each of the buyer types. So, you know, sometimes just plugging that technology in, or a lot of the times, just plugging that technology in just doesn't simply work. So, no, it, it's like it's like a lot of things because you have to put thought into it. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, 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 yeah, this is out of the box. Let's use it. It's like, no, I mean, it's like, who uses Salesforce out of the box? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's I right. Mean, that's why there's a, an entire um, ecosystem of, of, yeah, of people that help you build your Salesforce instance. Yeah. Well, and that's, you, I mean, I don't know if that was deliberate on Salesforce's part or not to build that ecosystem, but, but yeah, it exists. And this is, I mean, <laughs> I remember talking to a company over a year ago that was a good-sized company, putting in CRM for the first time. First time, it's like a company is doing close to $100 million in, in revenue. And they were just going to do a vanilla implementation. <laughs> I was like, okay, good luck. I mean, they just couldn't be – I wasn't involved in selling them, but I was trying to encourage them to engage a Salesforce consulting firm to you know, have expertise on doing that. And no. Nope. Just they didn't have it in the budget. They just had a budget to buy Salesforce. <laughs> oh. Yeah, but, but you have to start somewhere, right? So you've got to develop that pain point in the first instance. 
Well, yeah, they, so I'm sure yep. they they have. I've not checked back with them. I'm sure they have developed that game. But... <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they've got somebody in helping them out by now. So, talking about cadences, then. So, what is the secret to a good cadence? Because this is really sort of the heart of your book. Is is you know you have sort of your five steps you take with targeting and so on. But but in the cadence itself, what do you see as the things that make it effective? Well, you have to start with the with the with the persona of the person, right, and understand how it is that they are likely to be, communicate with you. Yeah, you know, so the good old email and 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 telephone is pretty much on everybody's cadence, so every salesperson's you know outbound methodology. But you know the reality is, and you know I, I talk specifically to Australia, but you know that's not going to work for a, for a lot of buyers. So if you're selling tech to HR or to or to marketing, you know, they're notorious at not picking up the telephone. Doesn't mean that telephone can't be part of the strategy, but it can't, you know, we can't have 70% of our outreaches as a telephone strategy because it's just not going to work. In, yeah, in Australia, w- what happens is people flip that and they'll have 30% telephone and 70% email and they think that that's, you know, clever. Well, we're in an omni-channel world, right? So you can't, you can't be so focused because... You have to sort of spend time where you're going to intersect with your your buyer. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so if you can look at their persona and understand where they're going to spend their time and what sort of channels they're going to be on, then we should be spreading ourselves across those those channels to try and create that prospecting pressure that I spoke of before, so that so that you're basically pattern interrupting a typical outreach, and people can go, "Hey, this this Andy guy," or you know. Um, is somebody different? I've got messages across a couple of different channels, and, and the messaging seems to to hit me right between the eyes. It's it's something that a pain point that I'm thinking about. It's something that I need to know about. There's some value in that conversation, uh, and so what that might look like would be, you know, using email, of course, using um, telephone, of of course. There's lots of conversation about whether voicemails work or not. About thirty percent of people apparently listen to voicemails, so I'm an advocate of leaving a voicemail but not asking for a reply. Mm-hmm. Here in Australia, it's easy for us to send a text message. I like sending a text message with my contact card, you know, and saying, hey, mm-hmm. Andy, understand you didn't pick up my phone call. Not answering telephone numbers that you don't know is common. Here's my contact details. I'll be reaching out in the next couple of weeks to try and start a conversation. Mm-hmm. I, I find that's a really soft way. Sometimes the text message comes back, hey, that's great, you know, and you find that people are likely to communicate by text message on occasions. So you can see already we're starting to expand, you know, the, the touch points from a typical off-the-shelf, inverted commas, cadence, and you're going to be more likely to start a conversation. Um, direct mail is, is popular, difficult while everyone's working at home. <laughs> um, you know, um, Stu Heine, um, mm-hmm. he's an absolute legend. He's got some great yes. ideas. Um, great but, you know, great that, books. That helps if you're an awesome cartoonist. <laughs> but, I'm not, but, but you know, those are great ideas in the book. Yeah, and, and the concepts are great, right? So all you need to do is just, you know, the, the thing that you would normally send via LinkedIn, which is another great channel. So if you would normally send an article to Andy Paul and say, hey, Andy, you know, here's an article I thought was valuable for you. You could, you know, when people are in the office, simply print that off and write a handwritten note and send that in the mail. Hey, Andy, found this article. It's right up the alley, you know, right along the the um, mindset of what I wanted to talk about. Here's mm-hmm. a, a really powerful part I've highlighted it for you in, in the page number three. Here's the part that you need to look at. Um, I'll be calling you in the next couple of days to have a chat about it, you know, and stick that in the mail. It'll cost you, a, in Australia, it'll cost you a dollar to do that. It'll arrive two days later. And then calling somebody that's got something on their desk, I'm not sure about the USA, but, you know, here it's unusual for you to get some ha- handwritten Yes, no still unusual. Days. Yes, or has become unusual. Let's say. Yeah, used to be used to be quite usual back fifty years ago. So, so just adding those extra touches where where appropriate, according to your persona, um, is, is going to make a big difference. So, one of my clients, for example, we, we're trying to engage some um, construction industry. So, when we started to look at the best way to reach out to people in construction, um, they they bought a list. You know, they started to build a cadence to, to reach out to people in construction. What, what they realised was that there's two very clear segments. There's there's the small 
guys that are driving around in in little delivery vans, if you like, you know, air conditioning mechanics and installers, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. All right. And um, and then also in construction is the guys that are building roadways. You know, so they've got massive big trucks. You know, and they leave them on the side of the road. Um, you know, they're digging up the pavement. They're laying right. pavement. Yeah. So so trying to talk to those two people because they're in construction the same way is not going to work. You're going to you're going to miss the mark. So the guys in the vans, of course, you know, email, text message, telephone is going to be significantly successful. The guys that are running the 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 organizations or the guys that we need to talk to that are running, you know, the, the big earth moving type stuff, they're in the office. They're basically like a, like an, uh, like an office guy or girl. Right. So, so just because they're in construction, <laughs> you know, they service the construction industry. Uh, you, 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 can, you can't take a, a single approach to those, to those groups of individuals. You need to divide that up. Well, and do you think that's, that is one of the problems though that you're seeing with, with companies is that they're just, you know, they're not uh, targeting specifically within, you know, an industry. You know, they assume that everybody's sort of the same. Yeah, well, it's, it's I mean, what's spam? What's spam? Sp- spam is basically any message that you receive that's not, that you don't think is relevant or not designed for you. <laughs> Which even the ones that <laughs> supposedly are designed for me aren't. I mean, I was just looking at, you know, my LinkedIn messaging, which I'm sure like most everybody that's listening to the show these days is is inundated with sales pitches. And it's like, I mean, the <laughs> they sort of fall into interesting categories, right? So like one is, and I this audience knows, and I told you before the show that, you know, back in February, my podcast was acquired. We renamed it in April. So we're recording this in August. So it's been five months since we renamed and rebranded the podcast and so on. And, and I get people, you know, pitching me all the time for services for podcasters using the name, the old name of the podcast. Yep. Right. Which is like, huh, interesting. Um, <laughs> or, uh, yeah, I mean, it sort of goes on and on. It's like, you know, people pitching me lead gen services. And again, yeah. <laughs> you know, I haven't, I haven't. <laughs> it's not relevant. It's just not relevant. And it's, and they're just spending no effort at all on this and it's amazing how many people still do it and think that again they're playing the numbers game you know if they get enough people to respond to it it works and they'll keep doing that as opposed to thinking hmm how can i be more targeted here how can i get a higher conversion rate higher win rate all these things by being more focused on the quality of what i'm doing as than just the quantity yep so the, and the challenge is that the quantity in the the quantity the quantity play in some instances actually still works so so yeah. that's that's why people that's do the, that's the unfortunate thing so if you're a mortgage broker for example and and you know you connect to a couple of hundred people on linkedin every day in your local region you know that you can service uh, and you send them a message that says hey you know did you know that you can um save some percentage points on your mortgage uh hit me up if you you know here's my my here's my calendar link knock yourself out um you know a percentage of people are, are going to do that and if you're not worried about how you come across professionally um then <laughs> exactly then, and, and i've called i've you know i've fallen i've gone down that rabbit hole and i've called people out and and me i too. remember one guy said to me you know mate i'm getting 12 percent response rates to to which was just a spam connection you know in the connection mm-hmm. request it was like hey mark you know professionals like you um often have a mortgage and um are spending too much money here's a link grab grab some time and i'll show you how to save money and I was like, man, this is so cheesy. And he's like, hey, it's working. I'm like, can't argue. I'm like, what yeah. about your personal? What about your personal brand? He goes, I don't care. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like no. okay, well, I can't. what can I do with I, that? Nothing. Yeah, I would argue that that if we're able to have a close inspection of what that person's doing, it's not a twelve percent open rate and not doing that well. But that's just the skeptic in me. Yeah, well, I agree. I'm just regurgitating exactly what he <laughs> yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but most people, like people like you and I, and most of the people listening to this podcast, because people listening to this podcast want to be good at sales, is my bet, right? So the people that you know that are listening to this podcast are interested in being better, and yes. so they're not the pe- they're not the people that want to be seen as unprofessional, right? So, so what's the alternative? The alternative is target your audience, you know, and with a relevant message and deliver that message across a, a vehicle 
multiple vehicles that where they're going, likely to be in a way um, that people are going to want to be receptive to. So that's, well, that's the answer. Yeah. Well, when you talk about that in the book is, is sort of this dual motivation of personal branding and, and professionalism with, with, uh, with sellers. Um, but I think that, yeah, a lot of sellers get sucked into uh, behaviors that they don't, you know, they don't really look at and say, okay, well, how's this reflecting on me personally? Uh, and I think that's, it's an issue because you know, I know the first thing I do when, when I get a either email or a LinkedIn message, I mean, obviously on LinkedIn, I'll check out somebody's profile. If I get an email, something oftentimes I'll check out profiles as well. First time. And, yeah. um, yeah, this is, this is something you do have to think about is, is as a seller, you have to be able to protect your brand because it's something you have with you throughout your entire career. And increasingly now it's available to everybody to see. Correct. Yep. And, I, and I've learned the hard way. You know, if I send you a, a cheesy message, Andy, you know, when I'm starting out in sales on LinkedIn and three years later, I've learned all these new skills and I understand what I was doing was wrong and I go back to, aim, to send you a message, guess what's still there? That message from three or four years ago. Oh, yeah. Because, because it's on my profile. It's, so I might have changed jobs two or three times, but, you know, and what you're going to do is go, oh, here's a message from Mark. Oh, hang on, i got a message from Mark. Is it? It's pretty bad. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm going to put my hand up here, you know, like I've been on LinkedIn for 10 years, you know, some of the messages I sent 10 years ago, weren't that great. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a, that's a really interesting point though. You're talking about this. Our, uh, our learning curve as sellers is now public record. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's what's making the challenge because, you know, sales leaders are saying do more activity and sales reps know that a lot of this stuff is attached to them now. You know, it, it's no longer Mark from XYZ, you know, Mark from Oracle. It's, it's mm-hmm. Mark McGinnis. And we're, we're all told to build a personal brand that stands above our, our organization that we work for. And because we don't work for the same organization, typically we, we move, you know, every couple of years. Mm. We want Mark McGinnis to be a standalone expert, right? So... You know, we're encouraging as individuals and also as sales leaders, we're encouraging people to build their brand outside of the logo. Um, whereas before, if you send a whole bunch of poorly worded or crappy spammy messages from Mark at Oracle, everyone just went, oh, well, that's Oracle. And I'm sorry to Oracle, I'm just using that as an example. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've got some friends there. They're very good. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> no reflection on Oracle, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, insert large company here. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so, so I think that's a real challenge. You, you know, so that's stopping people from taking action. That's stopping reps from taking action because they're aware of the fact that this is going to reflect badly on me or it might reflect badly on me. So they need that confidence to go, how can I reach out in a way that's going to, going to actually support my desire to be seen as a professional? Yeah. Well, and the way to do that is, is to buy your book and read it. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> well, I just I wanted to wanted to bring that up because unfortunately we're running short on time. We've been having sure. a great conversation, but didn't get as deep into the book as we wanted. But but I will tell people it is a it is a great guide and very practical as you talk about for people how to put together a more effective cadence. Um, the tools are there. We're all using the tools. So yeah, how to think about it more effectively, how to again be more targeted uh, with your messaging, with your outreach and all that, that yeah. So you don't have as many wasted sales cycles dealing with prospects who are just never going to buy from you, but instead be much more effective. Yeah, and hopefully, get, and and get some you know self belief back about how good being a salesperson is, as opposed to just somebody who's who's trying to manipulate as many people as possible. To go back to our very first point. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I yes, and I think that that. Um, Using the technology more effectively in the ways that you talk about is, is one way to to do that and be more more thoughtful. So, yeah, I think for sellers, you know, it they have to take responsibility. It's one for their own actions you're talking about and how they're portrayed in the market. Again, as you talk about building your brand, and I'll say this for people listening: yes, is yeah, you may have a, a sales process in the company you're working at. Manager wants things done a certain way, and if you think it's not the right way, you think there's a more effective way then take a risk and do it you know yeah. if, if because 
ultimately it is your brand. It is your success. And if it means ultimately you have to change locations to find a, a different environment where you can become the best version of yourself, then don't spend a lot of time waiting for that. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That's good advice, Andy. Well done. Hey, yep. thanks. That's why I get to pay the big bucks. All right. So, <laughs> Mark, thank you very yep. much. So, tell folks how they can find out more about what you're doing and, and get your book. Okay. So, I'm a, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. So, if, if you're on LinkedIn, feel free to connect with me there. If you, but I, but I try, try to keep my network very clean. So, if you don't have, if it's not immediately obvious that you're in sales, you run the risk of me not connecting. So, please just make a little note saying, hey, I'm in sales. If your headline says you're a business development manager or, or something like that, you'll be fine. Um, I try to make sure my network is full of sellers. Uh, Book-wise, you can grab it from all the usual, you know, Amazon, et cetera, that sort of stuff. Um, feel free to check that out or you can check it out on my website, which is markmc.co. All right. Excellent. Well, Mark, a pleasure Andy. to talk with you. Mate, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on and share the story. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was fun. We'll do it again. Thanks. Okay, friends, that's it for this episode. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. I'm so grateful for your support of the show. And I want to thank my guest, Mark McGinnis, for sharing his insights with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement, with Andy Paul on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And thank you so much for investing your time with me today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. RingDNA is the leading sales enablement platform that uses AI to help scale business growth. Trusted by the top companies across the globe, RingDNA offers a suite of powerful tools for every sales role. The RingDNA dialer radically improves sales productivity and call connection rates, while guided selling helps reps know exactly what to do and when to do it. Conversation AI uses artificial intelligence to surface the most impactful coaching opportunities in real time. So no matter where your team is working from, the RingDNA platform can help them exponentially increase call connections, opportunities, and revenue. Learn more at ringdna.com slash platform. That's ringdna.com slash platform.